Good morning, my friend. I hope you're doing well. It's um, Monday morning. I'm watching the sunrise. I wanted to just kind of um, continue with this idea that we've been discussing a little bit about self-brain surgery. You know, I'm always saying you can't change your life until you change your mind. And that's kind of coalescing into a new book idea that I'm, I'm working on that I'm tentatively calling Infinitely Happier, A Neurosurgeon's Thoughts on Thinking. Because the reality is that how we think determines almost everything about how we live. And so if we have bad thinking or thinking that's not productive, then it can really harm us in all areas of our lives. And so that's why I, I, I look at learning how to change how we think as sort of a form of self-brain surgery. But today, we're going to talk about another thing that's related to life change, and that's courage. Because it's scary. when you When you know you need to change something but you could just not change it and continue living like you're living, sometimes it's easier and it feels safer to just keep things the way they are, even if the way they are isn't perfect. This is why a lot of people stay in abusive relationships because it seems scarier to leave or seems scarier to change or tell somebody what's happening than it is to just tolerate the behavior. Like The the fear of change sometimes seems worse than the situation we're in. And even if you're in a good situation, but you feel like God is calling you to something better, it can be really scary to take that step to say, yes, I'll do anything. God, I'll follow you. That's sort of, uh, in a nutshell, what's happening here in Wyoming with us. Um, I told you I'd tell the story, and there's, there's another episode, or maybe two or three, down the road to get into the whole thing about why we're moving and, and what's going on here. But But the basics of it is... We have a good situation, and God is calling us to one that's even better. And it's scary. It's a difficult decision to make that step, to give up the comfort of something you know um, for the unknown. But when you know God is calling you to it, you can't really be happy if you don't follow that lead. And so we're going to talk today about courage, how it is that we shake off the fear of change and finally step in to the freedom that we're designed to live in. And as I've said, the problem with, with life is that most of us spend our lives reacting to our own thinking because we don't really think about our thinking. And one part of our thinking that we don't think enough about is how we slip into comfort zones and we're afraid to challenge them, that we have um, these, these zones in our brain that we protect and wall off and sometimes use patterns of behavior and habits to... Um, keep us from having to challenge our thinking or if, uh, admit to certain realities. And so we're going to learn how to get out of that comfort of sameness and take the courage to get into the arena and fight for the freedom and the excitement and the future that we believe that God is calling us into. The fresh wind of the life that we're supposed to live is really better than the comfort zones that we allow ourselves to stay in. We can't change your life until we change our minds. And today, we're going to talk about courage because it takes a lot of courage to shake off old patterns, behaviors, fears, and step into the fight for the freedom that we're meant to have. Jesus said that he came to give us an abundant life. But so many of us spend our days trying to find a way to numb ourselves when life doesn't feel so abundant instead of taking up the fight to change it. We've been talking about this verse in Proverbs, the the Passion Translation. It's kind of a new Bible translation that I've been reading some. And in Proverbs 17, 27, and 28, it says, Can you bridle your tongue when your heart is under pressure? That's how you show that you are wise. An understanding heart keeps you cool, calm, and collected no matter what you're facing. And this is one of the secrets to becoming infinitely happier. This idea of learning how to stay cool, calm, and collected no matter what we're facing. Can we bridle our brains when our thoughts are harming us, when, they're, when our thoughts are keeping us from that cool, calm, and collected ability to, to make decisions and step into life with a clear head? That's what we're working on. That's how we become infinitely happier. And it's useful during a global pandemic, but it's also useful in everyday life. We're trying to do it ourselves sometimes by turning our brains off, by hiding in comfort zones, by numbing ourselves to the anxiety and fear of, of the change that we feel like we're being called to. And instead of that, we want to finally get free. And so today, we're going to find the courage to change. We're going to find it together, and we're going to start today. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. 
you have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. That place is called self-brain surgery. You can learn it and it will help you become healthier, feel better, and be happier. And the good news is you can start today. Thanks, Lisa. Hey, so glad to have you listening today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I live in Nebraska in the United States of America with my incredible wife, Lisa, my father-in-law, Tata, and the super pups, Harvey and Lewis. I'm a neurosurgeon and an author, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better, happier life. Listen, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and I'm here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery to get it done if you like the show. Please subscribe so you never miss an episode and tell your friends about it. If you tell two or three friends this podcast was helpful to you, imagine how much good we can all do around the world together. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'm here to help you change your mind so you can change your life. Let's get after it. Man, I've had so many ideas for this episode, um, but it's been really hard to sit down and just finally get it recorded. And maybe that's because some of the things I want to talk to you about are things I need to figure out. That's really the truth I think about most writers. Like most of the things we write about when we're trying to help other people are really because they're things that we want to talk to ourselves about. So that's part of why I write. It's why I podcast. It's why I share just about everything I do. It's really because I'm working through stuff and sorting things out for myself. And I confess that I've been more and more, like writers do, I've been metaphorically looking at this COVID-19 situation. And I've recognized that the situation that we're seeing with COVID-19 in our society across the world may, has, has really pointed out that we desperately need to want to be free. We've seen how quickly our society can go from total freedom to forced lockdown. We've seen how the basic things that we took for granted three months ago, like going to church or to a park or hugging your friends, going to a restaurant, they're now prohibited. Somebody's telling us that we can't do those things. And that's made us all long for freedom again. We might love our homes, but if you're forced to stay inside them for a long time, they start to feel like prisons. And in our lives, I've recognized there are so many things that we rightly can claim that we have the freedom to do. In fact, Christians can rightly claim in the Bible that we have broad freedom to live just about however we want within the confines of of holy living. I mean, it's okay to drink a glass of wine. It's okay to eat any kind of food. We don't have prohibitions against certain foods that we can eat in in modern Christian thought, according to the New Testament. But the problem is that the things that we take, that we, that we believe that we're free to do and are free to do, can sometimes quickly become things that enslave us. And we can end up being slaves to things that we allowed ourselves to do because we agreed and thought that we were free to do them. So it's a slippery slope. And when we're talking about life change, we have to recognize the neuroscience of why it's so easy to end up staying put in certain patterns or certain ways of life or certain sometimes relationships or actual physical places rather than making the change once we realize we need to make it. When we're facing stress, major change, uncertainty, relationship problems, financial strain, illness, whatever, Our brains can be so full of anxiety and racing thoughts about it. You sit there and you think about financial problems, for example, and it's a weekend, so the bank's closed. You can't do anything about it. You don't get paid for a few days, and nobody's coming to haul you off to financial jail or repossess your car. You're just you worried about stuff, so you sit there and you think, gosh, I don't get paid for another two weeks and this is going to happen and that's going to happen and I'm going to overdraft and I shouldn't have bought that thing and I'm I'm just ruined. Nothing good's going to happen. And you just sit there and you work yourself into this catastrophe that number one, probably isn't actually going to come to pass. And number two, there's probably 25 different ways that you could figure out to get around it or work through it or get some help to solve it if you would stop catastrophizing and start problem solving, Right. And number three, it's probably not nearly as bad as you think it is. And number four, you can't do anything about it right now. You can't fix it. The bank's closed. You can't call anybody. There's no way you can solve it. 
And so we sit there and we just catastrophize and we let ourselves work ourselves into this frenzy of thought that depresses our mood. It makes us stressed out. It makes us angry and irritable. It causes relationship stress. We yell at our spouse instead of fixing the issue or whatever. You kick the dog, right? And that's such a common thing. I used financial strain as an example, but it's such a common thing that we get into this pattern of worrying or not wanting to feel it anymore. And so we reach for something that helps us shut it off. We turn on the television. We zone into Netflix. We drink too much alcohol. We take pills. We we engage in relationship things, sexual behaviors. Some people choose pornography. We we do things to numb our brains and let us allow allow ourselves to think about something else or slip into some other pattern of thought or not thought that allows us not to think about the other thing. Uh, Brene Brown calls that numbing behavior. And the problem is, is I've been talking with you about the nervous system has a very limited set of responses to stress. If the tiger's chasing you, you feel anxiety, your heart races, you sweat, all those you know fight or flight kind of things. But you have the same feelings when you're just worried about something. You get the same set of neurochemical responses when there's a real threat as there is to one that you're just thinking about. And the same thing is true on the other side. When you numb yourself to life, when you when you do engage in a behavior to shut off your thinking and shut off your feelings so you don't have to experience it, you can't selectively numb. So... When you drink alcohol, you don't just stop worrying about the one thing. You also stop feeling the reality of your relationships. You also stop feeling the good things that are available. And so when you numb yourself with comfort foods or retail therapy or drugs or pornography or alcohol or whatever, when you do that, you limit your own emotional palate and you don't get to feel what your life is supposed to feel like. So you end up making yourself numb to the good things that are there that you would like to feel and experience along with being numb to the things that you don't want to experience. So here's the catch-22 of life. The things you're free to do very often end up enslaving you. There's two Bible verses I want to think about for a second. One is John eight thirty six, And in the ESV it says, If the Son, meaning Jesus, the Son of God, if the Son sets you free... You will be free indeed. In Galatians 5.1, the Good News Translation says, Freedom is what we have. Christ has set us free. Stand then as free people and do not allow yourselves to become slaves again. So I want you to keep those two verses in mind. We'll come back to them in a minute. But Jesus said several things. One in John 10 when he said, I came to give you an abundant life. And as Americans especially, if you're listening in other parts of the world, you probably relate to this too. But in America, we have this chip on our shoulder about freedom. Like we're free. We can make our own decisions. We can do what we want. And we kid ourselves sometimes. The government actually has more control than we think. But COVID-19 has made us realize that we, we aren't quite as free as we thought we were. And we want to be. And Jesus said, I came to give you an abundant life, a free life. John says, if, if, the, if Jesus sets you free, you are really free. And so... It's just this knife edge where we're free to do certain things, but those certain things can end up making us slaves to themselves. We end up sort of tr- treating our problem of our life, whatever it is that we're trying to avoid thinking about or feeling or some big change that we're supposed to make that we don't want to and we're numbing ourselves to it. We end up end up becoming a slave to the thing that we're using to numb ourselves to avoid the other thing that would end up being better for us. Does that make sense? So what do we do? How do we find the courage to shake off the things that are keeping us stuck or those things that we pretend to ourselves we think are making us feel better, but they're really just things that we're hiding behind? What gives? What do we do? Now, as an aside, let me just take a second to say this. There are some things that we need to recognize if if we don't decide to change them on our own that somebody or something are going to make us change them eventually. Let's take alcohol, for example. If you're using alcohol as a numbing measure for your life, if you're treating your anxiety with alcohol and it becomes a problem where you're using it excessively or at the wrong times, something's going to change eventually for you if that pattern continues. If If you project that out into the future far enough, 
you're going to have a little too much at some time and you're going to get a DUI and then you're going to be dealing with legal issues that will haunt you, maybe wreck your career, maybe wreck your family. You're going to have an accident and hurt yourself or God forbid hurt somebody else because you'll drink too much and drive. Or if you're a person who only drinks at home, you're going to fall down the stairs or you're going to get in a fight with your spouse or your kids and lose their respect or say something you shouldn't have said or do something you shouldn't do. And something's going to make you stop that. Or even if none of those things happen, if you keep using too much alcohol, eventually you're going to get liver cirrhosis or you're going to get some kind of medical condition that's exacerbated or worsened by your drinking. Or you're going to age too quickly or limit your lifespan. Something's going to happen if you project it out into the future. And something's going to make you change it. Same thing with drugs. Same thing with overspending. If you're not living within your means, then you're going to go bankrupt. You're going to get something repossessed. You're going to have a fight, and your spouse is going to say enough's enough, and they're going to leave you because you can't manage the money. Most divorces are related to finance, or at least a lot of them are. If you don't get that financial house in order, something's going to make you change that. You're either going to lose your house, lose your job, (laughs) you know, get in some kind of trouble, and you're going to have to change it and rectify it and downsize your life until you can live within your means. So you need to change it on your own terms. Again, we're talking about freedom today, right? So you do have the freedom to make the decision to change that numbing behavior, stop that spending, stop that drinking. Same thing with weight gain. If you're, if comfort food is your thing, then eventually something's going to make you stop that. You're going to get sick. You're going to have a heart attack. You're going to get diabetes. You're going to have a gallbladder problem and have to have surgery. Like something's going to occur with your weight or with your health if you don't quit using food as your comfort measure. What are some things that you can think of? What are some things that you have the choice to change now that if you continue to do or not do, as it were, you might lose that choice and something might force you, somebody might force you, something or some law or some health issue or some financial issue might force you to change. So wouldn't it be wiser then to change it on your own terms. When we're talking about wisdom, let me give you something to think about. Two scriptures that I want you to think about for a minute. Here they are. There's two places in the Bible where this metaphor or idea of level paths comes along. I've talked to my my kids about, especially my daughter, Kaylin, and I have had many conversations about this idea of level paths. So as a Christian, you're free to, to do what you want, go where you want, go to school where you want, you know, follow your heart. God's going to lead you. You're not um, mandated to go and do a certain thing for a living or any of that. In, in Christ, you have this broad freedom, but not all paths are equally wise. And so Proverbs 4.26 says this, make a level path for your feet and all your ways will be sure. There's four different translations. New International says, Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. The New Living Translation, Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. English Standard Version, Ponder the path of your feet. Then all your ways will be sure. And my favorite, the Berean Study Bible, that's that's not my favorite translation, but my favorite translation of this verse, Proverbs 4.26 in the Berean Bible, Make a level path for your feet, and all your ways will be sure. That idea is echoed in Hebrews 12, 13 in the NIV. Make level paths for your feet is in quotes. He's quoting the verse in Proverbs. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. What's this all about? The idea is when you're looking down the path of your life, if you can if you can make yourself think about the consequences the potential consequences of a particular decision that you're about to make then it would be wiser to choose the level path i'm not saying the easy path so don't don't confuse me here don't don't confuse what i'm saying to you here it's not safe it's not right to always just choose the easiest path that that will be a disaster for you especially listen to me if you're considering a relationship if you're a young person and you're dating it, choosing the easy, available, simple path, the comfort person who's easy, the low-hanging fruit relationship, that's not a path to a successful life. So don't hear me say that you should always choose the easy path. What I'm saying is once you know the path that God is 
asking you to follow, then choose the levelest, choose the safest way to get to that place. Choose the best path. It's like it's like um, planning a, a route. If I'm going to go to Nebraska, I put that in my nav, and it's going to give me several alternate routes, right? I can take the long way. I can take the highway. I can take the scenic route. I can take the country roads. But there's one of those in every time that's going to be the best. It's going to be the fastest. It's going to be the safest. It's going to be the, the most scenic, whatever it is that your your goal is there. There's always a path that's better than the other available paths. And that's what this verse is saying. Choose a level path. That's how you get there without falling down, hurting yourself, taking a detour. Make the level path, and that is wise. So what am I? why am I talking about all this stuff? Well, remember, we're talking today about how we can shake off this numbing behavior, how we can shake off the fear of staying put, and when we know we're supposed to make a change, how do we ramp up the courage, and how do we get there? How do we actually do it? Let's talk about Theodore Roosevelt for a moment. There's a speech that he gave in 1910 called Citizenship in a Republic. And the most famous part of that, it was a 35-page speech, but the most famous part of that is on page 7 of the speech, and it was called The Man in the Arena. And Brene Brown's written about this. Lots of people have quoted this. I'm not the first one to bring this out, so I'm just going to read it to you because there's a piece of it that I want to get to in a minute. So let me, let me tell you what Theodore Roosevelt said. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement? And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat? And my friend, this is why I'm always telling you, start today. You always hear me say that, and if you haven't been listening or reading for very long, you may not understand where that phrase comes from or why I'm always saying it, but it's this. There comes a moment in your life when you know, you just know that you're being asked by God, or if you don't believe in God, you're being asked by your heart. Something is calling you to something different. It's calling you to put the bottle down, to stop numbing yourself. It's calling you to make that phone call and accept that job in that other place. It's calling you to start this relationship or stop this relationship or go back to school. You're going to find some place where your heart is telling you, yelling at you, screaming at you that it is time to get in the arena and fight for the change that you know you're supposed to make. And it's scary. And it's easier to stay put. The situation I'm in, I have a good job. I have a contract that auto renews. Like they were never going to, I did a good job here in Wyoming. Everybody knows it. I'm a good doctor. I've done a good job here. Lisa and I have made an impact in this community. And I could have just stayed here. In fact, the, the, the finances were good that this, this is not a, a decision that's based on money that the contract that I had here is actually stronger than the one in Nebraska. But God is calling me. He's calling Lisa and I to a new thing to do what I do in a place that's never had a neurosurgeon, a community that's never had it. And it's scary because we're not just going from one job where the system is built like it is here and everything is fine and I can just stay here and keep doing the thing. We're actually going to a place where we're going to have to build it from the ground up and we're joining a, te- joining a team of people who are committed to creating a strong and robust neurosurgery program in a new community that has never had it. So if you live in that part of Nebraska and you have a head injury or a brain tumor or hydrocephalus or some kind of neurosurgical problem, you get flown out of there. Like Nobody's there to take care of you. And that means that the hospitals never had any expertise in doing any of these things. And so we're going to have to go there and train and teach. And at my age, I'm 51, this is a, a big task. I'm, I'm going to start a new program. Lisa's going to help me. We're going to build it just like we did in Alabama together. And we have a great team of people there and some great people going with us to make this happen. 
but it's not it's not safe it's not guaranteed it's not going to be easy but we can take a level path to get there there's a way that we can put together the right people partner with the right hospital like we have um, join forces and with like-minded people who are committed to the same goal and we can make safe steps that are level and will produce the right result even though it's going to be scary so when i say start today there comes a moment when you just know jesus is calling you to be free of the thing that's holding you back to stop that spending problem to say yes to this new job to Propose to the girl. There's a time when if you don't do it, you're going to hurt your heart. You're going to just stay numb to that part of your life. And you're going to miss an opportunity or you're going to hurt yourself or hurt your family. And it takes a great amount of courage to say yes when your heart is calling you. It takes a great amount of courage to step out into that unknown when you could just stay in the known, even if the known is not good for you. It sometimes feels safer to stay put. But that long failure of staying put is so harmful to your heart once you know that you're being called to get into the arena and fight for the new thing, to fight for the level path that's going to take you to where God intends for you to be set free again. Because the alternative to having that courage, the alternative to getting into the arena, the alternative to saying yes when God's calling you, the alternative to starting today is a life that is marked by being forced to react to other people's decisions or the consequences of your inaction or the failure to acknowledge what your own heart is telling you to do. That long failure of staying put ends up being so much worse than any failure that you might have if you actually get in the arena and get sweaty and let the get bloody and get beat up but end up winning the day. Or even if you fail, at least you tried. That long failure of staying put is so much worse. Friend, you have to try. If your heart is calling you to it, you've got to do it. It's time to stop numbing yourself to the experience of your life. It's time to shake off those things that are that you're free to do but could end up enslaving you. It's time to be free indeed. It's time to start making that level path to get you to where you're supposed to go. If you know there's a change you need to make, I want you to dare greatly. Look down the path to see what happens if you don't change it. Think down the future. Where's that path going to take you if you don't take the one that you're being called to? And what could happen if you do take it? And start today. Make the change. Get in the arena. Get after it. You've got it in your heart. God created you to be free. If the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. He created you to have an abundant and rich life, not to be numb to everything and just not even feel anything and try to shut your own brain off. He created you to shake that stuff off. Hebrews says, Cast off the chains that hold you down and hinder you. Cast them off. Shake them off and step into that challenge. You can do it. You can dare greatly. If the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Look, this is self-brain surgery. It's biblical. It's consistent with neuroscience. It's good self-care. It's time to get in the arena, friend. It's time to get after it. It's time to start today. Hey, thanks for listening. Please subscribe to the show so you automatically get every episode. And if you like the show, you'll love my weekly letter. Check out my writing at drleewarren.substack.com, drleewarren.substack.com. Get the free newsletter every week for my best prescriptions for becoming healthier, feeling better, and being happier through the power of faith and neuroscience smashing together via self-brain surgery, drleewarren.substack.com. And if you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at wleewarrenmd.com slash prayer. The theme music for the show is Make Us One by Tommy Walker, graciously provided for free by the great folks over at tommywalkerministries.org. Check it out and consider supporting them, tommywalkerministries.org. Remember, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I'll talk to you soon. God bless you, friend. Have a great day.